Will you please pray with me? God, bring us closer to you through these words. Build our relationships so we may serve our community and grow in faith. Amen. I read a story about a man named Jim who had a family, had a good job, and had his life seemingly together uh, when he lost it all. And he lost it all due to addiction. In this story, Jim's addiction was alcohol, but it really could easily have been any other addiction that we come across in our lives. He finally came around and he got help, but it was only after he lost his job, lost his wife and kids, and nearly lost his life. He was told that his liver was done and his life was very limited. And as he was working his recovery, he decided to return to church. And Jim came in and everyone seemed friendly enough, happy to see him again. It had been so many years. And he walked toward the front and he took a seat. And a short while later, a young couple came in. And they sat with their children right in front of him. And he watched the children and he watched the mother and he watched the father. And he decided he couldn't stay any longer. And he marched out the back of the church. See, Jim had a choice to make. He could leave and go get a drink, or he could stay the course in his recovery. There are moments in all of our lives, it might not be that dramatic, but there are moments in all of our lives where we have to choose direction, choose which course we should take. But we are indecisive people. At least I've come to see that. So many of us are so indecisive. We prefer our own comfort over the comfort of others. We'd rather avoid making tough decisions, even if it harms others. And we like the creature comforts that this world offers. And so when God asks us to choose which course of action to take, we often hesitate. And we often choose self-satisfaction, addiction, sin over God's will. But we are not unique in our human state. This isn't a new development in the course of humanity. The church is not unique in its brokenness. With the rise of the hashtag Me Too movement, you guys are familiar with that, right? It's been all over the place. We can see how often the church as a human institution has failed to listen to, advocate with, and serve victims of abuse. We choose the wrong course. So the question becomes, why? Why would we choose the wrong way? And it's because it's easier, really, when you read these stories, it's easier to allow one victim to suffer than for the rest of us to admit our sin and repent through changing our ways by changing course. The church in Ephesus struggles with making the right choices too. And the author of Ephesians, who is most likely a follower of Paul's, writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. Does that sound familiar to the world around us? Does that sound familiar to our own stories? So then, how do we know which courses to take in life? How how do we decide Which path we should follow? How do we improve ourselves and restore the church as an advocate of God's kingdom? Well, the pastor in this story happened to be in the back of the church when he saw Jim leaving. Jim, where are you going? He called out. And Jim replied, I'm just going out for a scotch. And the pastor said, wait a minute. Is your AA sponsor available? And Jim said, there's nobody that can help me. I just came in for a word of hope, and I ended up sitting behind this family. If I had my life together, I'd be here with my wife and kids too. The pastor said, wait right here. He didn't really know exactly what he was going to do because the service was supposed to start. And as he walked down to the front of the church, he prayed for a word of hope to give to Jim. And he welcomed everyone, and then he said, I have an announcement. If anyone here tonight is a friend of Bill Wilson, and if you are, you know what I mean. Could you please meet with me in the back of the church? 
And all over the sanctuary, men and women got up and made their way to the back of the church and they understood that announcement. And the pastor went back and put Jim in the hands of people who cared. And then while many stayed in the sanctuary and worshipped, the word, God's love, was being made real in the back of that church. Because Jim was experiencing community. He was experiencing the hope and love of Christ. He was being lovingly guided and encouraged to choose the course of Christ. So how do we choose? I mean, it works well in stories, but how do we in our lives choose which courses to take? Well, in Ephesians, the writer continues with 4 through 10, and we read, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. There's a whole lot that's in this passage, but today I just want us to see two things. And we should be able to remember these two things. First, there is nothing absolutely nothing that any one of us can do to earn God's forgiveness. To earn God's acceptance, to earn God's love, to earn God's grace. There is nothing because it is given completely as a gift. And second, this gift is given to everyone. And is a call for us to be together, to work together, to serve together, to make sure that together every voice is heard, every stomach is fed, every body gets rest. Even when we choose the wrong courses, make the wrong decisions, it's a still a gift from God who is rich in mercy out of that great love in which he has loved us, even when we were dead to our sins, to our addictions. He still wants to make us alive together with Christ. A little over a year ago, this church was presented with a different course. We were asked to help feed the hungry children in our schools. Basically, we were presented with an empty table. And we were asked, what will you bring to this table? So some of us, we heard this challenge and thought, we could bring food. We can bring love. And so we said, yes, we can do this. We knew it would be hard and a lot of work, but we've pulled together to do it and to continue to do it. And yesterday, as some of us sat in the school for the pancake breakfast, we got to hear some of the stories and thank yous from the people who've been directly affected by this ministry, from the children who received the bags from one very tearful teacher who who gets to see the kids receive the bags. Food for home is a correct course for us. It's a decision that we made and that we all have to work together to be able to stay on that path. But as an individual before us, every day are many options, many courses, many decisions. And we again and again are sold the lie that we can and should work alone to achieve our dreams. That we can do it alone, that we have that rugged American individualism coursing through our veins. But the blood that runs through us was redeemed long before our nation existed. And our Redeemer calls us to take the course of community. That we are not alone. We aren't islands. As I had to be reminded this week. We aren't islands. That we can work together. That we can love past differences in opinions. Differences in political ideology. Differences in sexual orientation. Differences in ethnicity. That we can choose the course of God's kingdom. Where everyone is welcome at the table. Where there is no distinction between us. Because we are all broken 
And yet we are all still loved by God. The gospel of passage, we didn't read it this morning, but we're going to in a minute, that's attached to the lectionary readings this week, comes from the gospel of John. And I didn't have us read this, I had us read the Ephesians one, because I want us to really listen to this. We know most of this one by heart. So I want us to really listen to these words that are actually meant to bring us together. John 3, 14 through 21 reads, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. But those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. And people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God." Did you know most of that one? We are called to unite against the evils of our world and shine light on them. That sounds really uncomfortable, doesn't it? I like the honesty here. (laughs) A lot of people are shaking their heads. Yes, that does. It sounds really uncomfortable, but that's what this passage is telling us. That we need to shine light on the evils in our world. So what are they? We need to shine light on the racist racist rhetoric that ruminates to keep people of power in power. We need to shine light on the millions spent by lobbyists to divide us poor against the poor, fighting over our, quote, rights and what we feel we, quote, deserve over others, while our identities, our health, our security, our voices are being taken from us. Shine light on the evil that tells us God has somehow been removed from schools, banned from politics, erased from our lives, when the simple truth is that we are too fearful to take God into the world with us. So we leave the divine here with our faith lives on pause until we can return another week, another month, or maybe never. This past week, I started reading stories. It started with just one news story. A story about a gymnast who who is being sexually assaulted and she told her pastor and her pastor, her pastor silenced her. And her whole church structure was silencing abuse. And it was just one story after another. Each story linked to more and more stories about churches silencing victims. I'm done with the evils being perpetrated by so-called evangelical Christians where suddenly morality no longer matters as long as a white man is in charge. Where the lives of victims who have been assaulted and abused mean less than the careers of the men who preyed upon them. Those are the evils of this world that we need to shine light on. These evils take life away from us. They take our energy, they take our time, they take our thoughts, where we become sympathetic to causes that are antithetical to Christ's good news. This is not the life that Christ brings. We shouldn't be okay with the hurtful things we say to one another or the playful excuses we make. Tisk tisk tisk. boys will be boys. Some will say that the evil is the church has stayed silent on not condemning the people that the human institution thinks is sinful. But right here in John, we read that Christ came not to judge, not to condemn, but to give life, to give us a better path, a chance to unite and move forward together, a chance to choose the right course of action. Did you know that fake news is shared is 70% more likely to be shared online than actual real researched news? 70% more likely to be shared. 
That's amazing, isn't it? That we're 70% more likely to share a lie than something truthful. So maybe an action we could take, a course we could take, is to actually stop and take a moment before we share on something. And ask, is we sharing this to spread the good news, the love of Christ, or are we sharing this to continue to spread hate and fear? Pastor Larry Wise makes an astute observation about churches and bricks. Have you ever heard of a clinker brick? I learned about them just this week when I found this story. A clinker brick are the bricks that are tossed aside when you're building a, a building that just don't quite fit. Maybe something's slightly wrong with them and so they just don't use them. And I've discovered like piles of bricks in our, around our house when I've, when I've dug ditches and things, and I've always wondered why they would be there. These must have been the clinker bricks back when they were building the house. They're always cracked or broken in some way. And though, although at times it seems as though the church is in ruin and rubble, God still sees it as a beautiful building. Clinker bricks are bricks that didn't quite make it. For some reason or another, they come out of the kiln, misshapen, or deformed. And there's a Presbyterian church in New York State that was intentionally built out of clinker bricks. Apparently, the congregation wanted to send a message. So they build their church of imperfect, rejected bricks. And the message is that we are all clinker bricks. We are sinners. We are imperfect people full of follies and foibles. But through Christ, we become living stones in his church. We do not become living stones because we are so great. It is Christ who is great. And we are connected into his church through him. I like that. We are all imperfect, and yet we are still called to do greatness through Christ. We are called to choose the course of light, to choose the course of love, to choose the course of Christ. Now this course will put us at odds with others in the world, but we can overcome those differences, not by name-calling or judging, but by showing that we, at First Christian Church, choose the course of Christ. We are one body, all together, all loved together, serving all together. In Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7, it says, So live in Christ Jesus the Lord in the same way as you received him. Be rooted and built up in him. Be established in faith and overflow with thanksgiving just as you were taught. If overflowing with thanksgiving, we show, we show the world, we choose the course of Christ, where we are all saved together, all loved together, and where we can continue to serve everyone together. Amen.